Good morning, AKF. This year, so 2024, uh, Easter falls in March. Easter falls in March. Easter is usually known as an April holiday, which brings up an interesting question. Do you know how the date of Easter is determined each year? Do you know? So a lot of holidays, they fall on a specific date, like Christmas is always on December 25th. And Independence Day is always on July 4th. But not so with Easter. Now, other holidays fall on a specific week of a given month. For example, Thanksgiving is the fourth Thursday in November. And Labor Day is always the first Monday in September but not so with Easter. Now, other holidays, they always fall on a Sunday, right? In certain months. So, for example, Mother's Day is always the second Sunday in May, and Father's Day is always the third Sunday in June. But not so with Easter. Will, how is this possible? Didn't we just cover all of the available options for holidays? Not quite. Easter, unlike most holidays, does not fall on a specific date each year. It does not fall on a specific week of a certain month each year. And it is not always on the same Sunday of a certain month. Unlike these traditional methods, Easter is actually based on the moon. Easter is based on the moon. Yes, the same moon that flat earthers say is not a sphere and does not have craters and is not a rock because it self-illuminates, yes, that moon. Easter occurs on the first Sunday following the first full moon that happens after the spring equinox. That is how Easter is dated. The spring equinox falls on March 21st. So the Sunday following the first full moon after March 21st, is Easter. Now, this means if there is a full moon the night of March 21st, and March 21st falls on a Saturday, Easter would be the very next day. Sunday, March 22nd. Anyone remember the last time that happened? Probably not. It was in the year 1818. And don't hold your breath because the next time Easter will fall on March 22nd is in the year 2285. Heads up, I won't be preaching that day. Since Easter falls in March this year, for the first time since 2016, and since this is the first Sunday in March, I want to take a look at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The beginning. The beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry really signified the beginning of his path to the cross. The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the most fundamental and foundational tenets of Christianity. And Easter is the Christian holiday where we celebrate and remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the beginning of Jesus' ministry is not often discussed. Easter messages 
are usually centered on the last week of Jesus' life. What's become known as the Passion Week. And the beginning of the resurrection story really starts in many ways with the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now exactly when was the beginning of the ministry of Jesus? We can point to many events in his existence as the beginning of his ministry. We could choose the incarnation when he came down to earth. We could choose when he was baptized by John. We could even argue that the true beginning was before the foundation of the world as part of God's overall plan. Today, we are going to look at the beginning as when John the Baptist was imprisoned. This seems to be, as we read through the Gospels, this seems to be a triggering event where Jesus knew it was now his time to move. John, John the Baptist, was the forerunner of Christ and his arrest signaled a passing of the torch, so to speak, that John's role was now complete and Jesus' full-time ministry would now begin. One of the things that has helped my own personal study of the Bible and has really brought the Bible to life for me is understanding the geography of the Bible. So let's look at the start of Jesus' ministry when John was put into prison, and we will start with the geography. Now the start of Jesus' ministry is mentioned in all four Gospels, and you will see a key location mentioned in all three synoptic Gospels. Let's start with Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 reads, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And finally, Luke chapter 4, also verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. You can't miss the geographic marker in all three of these Gospels. So where is Galilee? More importantly, what is Galilee? Galilee often referred to as the Galilee, was and is a region in the land of Israel. The region is in the northern part of Israel. Here is a picture to give you an idea of where the region of Galilee was. I like this picture as it gives you an idea of where it was on top of a more modern map of Israel. So you can see the Gaza Strip there, where Israel is currently at war with Hamas. And you can see the surrounding countries of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. So Jesus travels to the Galilee to begin his ministry after John is put in prison. He is returning to Galilee from Judea where he was baptizing and gaining new disciples. The fact that Jesus makes this decision to depart Judea as soon as he hears John the Baptist was put in prison is certainly no coincidence. It is likely That since John the Baptist was now being silenced, seeing as he was the forerunner of Christ 
proclaiming the coming Messiah, that was Jesus' cue to pick up where John left off. So Jesus heads north from Judea, which is another region in Israel, through Samaria, another region, to the Galilee region. And after a stop in Cana, where he had previously turned water into wine, on this trip, he healed the nobleman's son. Jesus then returns to the place where he grew up, the town of Nazareth. Now consider that he has been away from home for about a year at this point. He left initially and was baptized by John. He then spent 40 days in the desert and was tempted by Satan. And then Jesus spent about eight or nine months baptizing in Judea. Now here is a map of Israel. I usually include the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea in pictures of maps of Israel to make it obvious that we are looking at Israel. Those are the two bodies of water in the middle there. And the yellow star just to the west of the Sea of Galilee is the city of Nazareth. Now I believe Jesus went to Nazareth right away knowing he would not be accepted. He knew he would not be accepted. Why? Because it was his hometown. We've all experienced this, by the way. If you're really good at something, or you're known for something, your family members really can't really accept that, right? They're like, no, that's just that person that I've seen grow up. That that person's not special. That's, that's, That's what Jesus went through with Nazareth, but obviously to a much greater scale. Now Luke's account is the only one that tells us what happened in Nazareth. And it's pretty important both historically and geographically. So let's read Luke's account in chapter 4 starting with verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled, at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly I say to you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian." So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city 
And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. What a start to your ministry. They tried to kill him from the very beginning. This happens to be one of my favorite miracles in the Bible. As he walked through the people trying to kill him. Imagine what must have gone through their mind at the time. Now, it's no secret that children leave the faith very often after they leave the home. And something I'm a bit obsessed with and will continue to always talk about is apologetics. Apologetics is the branch of theology concerned with defending our faith. Defending our Christian faith. Jesus was a real person. Galilee was a real region in Israel. Jesus was a real person. Nazareth was a real town in Galilee. Jesus was a real person. And you can even visit Nazareth today, and it's in the exact same spot it's always been. Putting two and two together, most reasonable people would conclude that the events which I just read to you from Luke 4 are historical events that actually happened in the places it said they happened. Now, of course, skeptics cannot agree to this, or Christianity and theism are both pretty much true at that point. If they just agree to the few verses I just read in Luke 4. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to deny some or all of these things. They might say Jesus was not a real person. Or they'll say, okay, Jesus was a real person, but these events didn't happen because miracles don't happen. Well, I think it's pretty obvious That if the people are real, and the locations are real, then wouldn't the events be real too? But some people are stubborn. And so I'm going to show you an incredible geographical argument that this story is historical and really happened. According to Luke... It says they drove him out of the synagogue to the brow of the hill on which their city was built. So this leads to an interesting question. If we go to Nazareth today, again, you can visit Nazareth to this day. If we go there, is the city built on a hill? The answer is yes. If you grab your 3D Israel map, by the way, I keep this at my bedside for whenever I need it while reading the Bible. It's one of my favorite Bible study tools. And if you find Nazareth just to the west of the Sea of Galilee, you will see on this 3D Israel map that Nazareth is on a hill. You can see it right there. It's right there on the edge of the Jezreel Valley. Okay, the the elevation of Nazareth is over just over 1,100 feet. And then Luke continues and says, And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. So the next question is, 
is there a cliff on the brow of the hill that Nazareth sits on? Again, the answer is yes. It is known as the precipice of Nazareth or Mount Precipice. Here is a picture I took myself while in Nazareth standing right on Mount Precipice. As you can clearly see, there is a giant cliff. Right off that edge would be a certain death. And that is the Jezreel Valley in the background. So we have all of the geographic markers in Luke's story. We have the region, Galilee. The city, Nazareth. The city of Nazareth was built on a hill. And lastly, a cliff at the edge of town, Mount Precipice, where they attempted to throw Jesus off. This is actually quite remarkable. The level of detail that remains today to corroborate the gospel accounts. And so Jesus utilizes a miracle to escape this angry crowd in Nazareth. And before they can push him off the cliff, he walks right through the midst of them. Now I mentioned this is one of my favorite miracles in the Bible. And I've always envisioned an angry mob ready to throw Jesus off the cliff. And then all of a sudden, no one knows where he went. And people one at a time start looking at each other like, wait a minute, where did he go? While the rest of the crowd is still angry, and they slowly learn one at a time that he's essentially disappeared. By the way, if you want to see this entire scene, starting in the synagogue and ending with the miracle on the cliff of Nazareth, watch The Chosen Season 3, Episode 3. They did a really good job with this story. And while they portrayed the miracle different than I've always envisioned it, they still did a great job with this entire story. And it's worth a watch, and it brings in the emotional side of the story as well. So continuing in Luke, we read where Jesus headed next. Verse 31 of chapter 4. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee. We also see this in Matthew 4.13, which says, And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. The sea mentioned here is, of course, the Sea of Galilee. Grabbing our maps of Israel again, If you are ever looking at a map of Israel, the bodies of water in Israel will always make it easy to get your bearings on the geography of the region. So the Mediterranean Sea is the very large body of water that shows you the western border of Israel. The Sea of Galilee is the large lake on the north end of Israel. The Dead Sea is is the even larger body of water to the south. And then the Jordan River connects the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea and also represents the border between Israel and Jordan, their neighboring country to the east. And the final body of water is the Red Sea down here at the southernmost border of Israel. Once you are familiar with these bodies of water, you will never again miss Israel. I've seen pictures and videos from space, and I immediately recognize Israel without any labels or anything like that, just from the bodies of water. So coming up here to the north of Israel, to the Galilee region, find Nazareth again, And then find Capernaum, which is the town 
on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. As you can see, between those two spots, the terrain is very hilly and mountainous between the two. Because of this, we, we really know with almost certainty the path that Jesus walked to get from Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee as it says he did here in the Gospels. So I imagine after walking through this crowd in Nazareth, Jesus did not stop and headed straight for Capernaum. Since we know this path Jesus walked, which goes through the mountains as opposed to over them, you can actually walk this path today. This path has a name. It's called the Jesus Trail. If you want to learn more about it, or if you even want to go walk the Jesus Trail, just go to jesustrail.com. Now, I have not walked the Jesus Trail myself, but I took this picture of the Jesus Trail when I was just west of the Sea of Galilee. As you can see, the walking path is very obvious. No one is going to walk over those rocky and treacherous mountains when they are trying to walk from one town to the other. You see the clear path in between those large mountains to the left and the right and in the background. Once again, the geography of the story in the Gospels is confirmed even to this day. Since Jesus is now homeless, being rejected by his hometown of Nazareth, he is going to set up shop in Capernaum. Now Capernaum, which is located directly on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, will now be Jesus' base of operations. And it is here where he first calls apostles. Matthew and Mark's accounts are so similar, we will put them up together here on the same slide. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now, without understanding the timeline and story of what has already transpired thus far, this might sound a little hard to believe. Jesus just asks two random strangers to stop work, keep in mind this was their livelihood, and to follow him and they just do it? No. Peter and his brother Andrew were already very familiar with Jesus. Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And in John chapter 1, before John was put in prison, he introduced Andrew to Jesus. And then Andrew went and got his brother Peter and brought him back and introduced his brother Peter to Jesus. Now, this all took place in Judea, which is the region south of Samaria, which is the region south of Galilee. So, John the Baptist really did make quite an impact, having men all the way from the Galilee region come down to him in Judea. So, Jesus' calling here of Peter and Andrew is not out of the blue at all. They already knew Jesus. They already had spent considerable amount of time with him. And they had already come to believe through those interactions that he was the Messiah. So let's talk about this story. And again, look at the geography and also the archaeology. Now again, skeptics of the gospel accounts cannot admit that the events portrayed actually happened 
or they would be affirming Christianity and theism. So, very few of them today are going to argue that Jesus was not a real person. Which means the gospel accounts, in their view, must be fabricated. Now, there are so few scholars who hold to this idea that Jesus was not a real person. Maybe two that it's not even considered a legitimate position. And so it's not given really any credence. So they could take the position that Peter and Andrew were not real people, but that won't get them anywhere. I honestly don't even know if anyone takes that position. Probably not. We have writings from Peter. We have writings from different men about both Peter and Andrew One of them happens to be Paul. And come on, the national flag of Scotland is the cross of Andrew because Andrew was crucified. (laughs) The evidence is simply overwhelming. So if Jesus was real and Peter and Andrew were real, then the next thing they're going to have to do is they're going to have to deny that the story happened. This seems like the last thing they can do. And according to the story, Jesus walked from Nazareth to Capernaum and one day, while walking on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, calls Peter and Andrew to be his apostles. So the first question we need to ask is, if this is a fabricated story that never happened, are the geographical locations also fantasy too? Well, let's start with the easy one, the Sea of Galilee. Well, that's real. It's still there to this day, and it's in Galilee, just east of Nazareth. What about Capernaum? Was Capernaum a real city? Well, Matthew 4.13 tells us that Capernaum was by the sea, and it told us that Jesus called Peter and Andrew while they were casting their net into the sea. So Capernaum, if it's a real city, it would need to be right near the water on the Sea of Galilee. And what do you know? Capernaum was discovered, a fishing village on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. Archaeological evidence shows that this town was established in the 2nd century B.C. That stands for before Christ. And that also lines up with the story in the Gospels, as this town would have had to have been built prior to Christ, if the story in the Gospels is true. So far, so good. As we continue the story, we read in Mark 1.21, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. So Capernaum also had a synagogue, according to the story. This is pretty significant. Not all towns had synagogues back then. So this gives us another clue. And as you may have guessed, they discovered a synagogue in Capernaum, in 1866. Here is a picture of the synagogue that they unearthed. I took this picture while I was there at the synagogue in Capernaum. One small problem though. The stones and the design of this architecture are what was used in the 4th and 5th century centuries AD. So this particular synagogue is too late for the time of Christ. Now, this is where we got to put our thinking caps on. It makes sense that if there was a synagogue there, that there would have been a synagogue there earlier. Right? That's not only possible, it's highly likely. It's also possible that the 4th or 5th century synagogue was built on top of the previous synagogue. When you built things 2,000 years ago with giant rocks, you didn't just 
move them out of the way in order to upgrade to the latest architecture. It makes more sense to build on top of it using the stones as a foundation. Consider how today people even put carpet on top of wood floors. I've seen vinyl put on top of wood floors. As they further excavated this synagogue, here is what they found. You'll clearly see the different stones there. The ones below the existing synagogue are a different color. They are almost black. They are smaller and they're of a different shape. That's the older architecture. That's the same architecture seen in first century buildings. So that is most likely the first century synagogue. This is one of the inherent problems with archaeology. So often structures were built on top of older structures, and so you can't get to them without destroying the one above it. And who wants to destroy a beautiful 4th or 5th century synagogue. So I'm very content with this. We know Capernaum had a synagogue and that the synagogue most likely did not just randomly pop up after the time of Jesus, but was already there during his ministry. And they found one more thing, which in my opinion is simply stunning. This is an octagonal church excavated in Capernaum. And this church was built directly on top of a house. A house. And the houses uncovered in this area date to the first century BC, before Christ. The church was not only built directly on top of a house, but they can actually tell that the house was renovated in a way that it was no longer a house. It was renovated more as a place for communal gatherings. And they found graffiti scratched into the walls that said things like, Lord Jesus Christ, help thy servant, and Christ have mercy. And in the graffiti, they also found another name, the name Peter. Wow. Now, this doesn't mean for sure that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was Peter's house, but consider this. They found a house in Capernaum just steps from the location of the synagogue between the synagogue and the sea. The house dates to the first century B.C. In the years following Jesus' death, the house was transformed into a religious gathering place and they find both Peter's and Jesus' name scratched onto the wall. What's even more incredible is what Mark 1 tells us. Starting in verse 29, We read this. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, as soon as they had come out, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Notice it says... As soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew. This fits perfectly with the location of the excavated house, which is literally steps from the synagogue. Again, from a big picture standpoint, because it's very easy to get lost in the details, with the overwhelming evidence we have, Skeptics really have to agree that the people in the story, Jesus, Peter, and Andrew, were real people. They have to agree that the locations, the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum, the synagogue, were real locations. So that only leaves them with the last-ditch effort of claiming the stories 
were fabricated even though the people were real people and the locations were real places. This makes absolutely no sense to me. It just makes no sense to me. And how incredible that we find Capernaum, we find it on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, it contains a synagogue, and it contains a residence within steps of the synagogue, one that was renovated into a gathering place for Christians, and they find both Jesus and Peter's names etched onto the wall. Doubters will continue to choose to doubt. But this is incredible evidence. And I'm excited for what has yet to be uncovered and revealed, as I have no doubt it will continue to substantiate the biblical record. As we enter into the month of Easter, and look forward to remembering and commemorating the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope you enjoyed looking at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and the evidence that has been found of these very events. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we just come to you today, and I'm so thankful that there's a national holiday. A national holiday that we look toward what happened with your son, Jesus Christ, a national holiday to celebrate the resurrection. And Father, I just pray that uh, people have their eyes opened. They cannot just reject these stories. They cannot just reject this record. The evidence is there. We have eyewitness testimony. We have a written record in the Gospels, and we've got geographic evidence and archaeological evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. I just pray that this Easter season, people have their eyes opened and their hearts touched to this particular story. This is the most important story, one that will separate people or join them to you for eternity. And I just pray this all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.